Hello and welcome to tonight's Teachers Talk Radio with me, Maxine Howes. This tonight's um, Twilight Show on Friday the 3rd of November. Welcome. We'll be talking all things alternative provision this evening. Can't wait. Really excited to be talking on this topic. And we... Hello, and, and as always, not the slickest start to the show from me, but never mind. We're here, and it's Friday night, it's twilight, and we're here on Teachers Talk Radio to talk alternative provision. Um, it's a real privilege to be able to talk AP, alternative provision, this evening. Um, a bit like I, I often start off by saying this is an area where I am not an expert, so I've called on five experts, five senior leaders who are going to join us this evening to talk about alternative provision and to talk about their experiences working working in that alternative provision. So really excited that they are going to be joining us this evening. And we've got, got a couple of them. They're starting to, to join us already. So whilst they're, they're catching up, I'm just going to set a little bit of context and talk about, about what we're doing and, and why we're working and why I've felt so inspired to talk alternative provision. So my very first Teachers Talk radio show, going way back to around Easter time in 2022, you might, um, if, you, if you've been a regular listener, you might recall my very first show where I was joined by Claire. Claire is an assistant head. She was just due to be starting at the time as, as an assistant head at the Academy of Central Bedfordshire, a fantastic alternative provision um, for school in central Bedfordshire and Claire's got um, a really exciting role as being in charge of um, uh, and her lead role is all about well-being so an assistant head with a lead role on well-being and our first show was all around well-being so so knowing Claire well and also being fortunate to be able to work as a coach with some of the ACB's leaders that really prompted me to want to talk alternative provision on one of these Teachers Talk radio evenings. And then I saw the story about a student from um, a middle, a, an alternative provision or a pupil referral unit, actually, in Milton Keynes, who's now studying history and politics at Cambridge University. And all of these things together, knowing Claire, having spoken about to Claire about her well-being role at the ACB, coaching and working with these fantastic leaders. And then this story, that was it. We've, we've got to have a Teachers Talk Radio alternative provision special. So welcome to that this evening tonight and on um, Teachers Talk Radio. So we're going to be welcoming five leaders from the alternative provision in, in question from the Academy of Central Bedfordshire. It's possible that one of those that, that um, Lynette might stay um, just as a uh, just listening and maybe contribute a little bit by the chat. But Lynette, I'm really sorry to hear that you're still feeling poorly and still recovering from a, a really, really awful, I think it's cold and, and illness that you've, you've got there. So sorry to hear about that. But we are going to be joined by Paul, who is the um, executive head of the Academy of Central Bedfordshire, which covers two sites to so split sites, one in Houghton Regis, one side of Bedfordshire and one in Stockfold. And then we are going to, I'm so pleased, Lynette has just asked to join as a speaker. That tells me you're feeling better. That's great. So we've also then got Lynette, who is deputy head 
and she leads on behaviour and attitudes and runs one of the sites. We've then got Rita, Rita Puscatelli, who leads on curriculum, on quality of education, deputy head on one of the other sites. Claire, we've met before, I mean, is a regular contributor on Teachers Talk Radio, who um, leads on wellbeing. And Josh, who is assistant head at the Houghton Regis site and, and leads on um, personal development and wellbeing. So really excited to have those people in us and they're pretty much all connected and I should be coming over to them as the experts soon. But I just want to just set a little bit of background and they are really welcome to correct me if I'm wrong on any of this because they are the experts and I'm not. So the DfE um, defines alternative provisions as settings that provide education for children who can't go to a mainstream school and that idea of can't go to a mainstream school may be as a result of, of exclusion or illness or lengthy suspension or a range of other reasons and we'll be delving into some of those other reasons and, and how children have um, come to attend the Academy of Central Bedfordshire and um, alternative provision and schools can arrange for pupils to improve their behaviour and access a more suitable provision off-site. And that's one of the, the rights that head teachers have, and that, that's one of the ways that we, we can make sure children are in alternative provisions. Alternative provisions settings vary enormously. We may be talking about pupil referral units. We may, as we are particularly focusing on this evening, talking about alternative provision academies and free school settings. And they have really taken off since the 2010 Academies Act. We might also be looking at other specialist settings, therapeutic or otherwise, other than mainstream schools. So youth centre settings, sports facilities, outdoor learning centres, forest schools, animal assisted therapeutic centres, vocational practical settings like car mechanics or hairdressers or community centre settings. But the core aim is to advance pupil development in a setting other that is different to the traditional classroom. APs usually offer smaller numbers and include a greater focus on pastoral support. So I really look forward to hearing more about that. There's been a lot in the news and a lot written about inconsistencies in, in AP and a big change from March 2023 government publishing Send an AP Improvement Plan. The right support, the right place, right time, including a vision for a single send an AP system based on five core values being nationally consistent, being evidence driven, responsive, co produced, and inclusive. So I'd be really interested to hear what the, these experts in a bit hear all, like think all about that. But I was fascinated um, about the story of um, a young man who started to attend a pupil re referral unit in Milton Keynes um, when he was in year seven and now getting into Cambridge University. And that's a fascinating story about a young man called George Bulldog. Um, and he attended the Bridge Academy um, in, in West Bletchley when he was in year eight. And his reasons for that was stuff, suffering from severe anxiety and not being able to access mainstream school. And he attributes his success to the guidance, care and teaching he received at, at the pupil referral unit and the dedicated team of staff who are experts at working with children with special educational needs and disabilities and with SEMH, with social, emotional and mental health difficulties. And he talks very much about the perception of a PRU being that it's full of naughty kids. But actually, Lots of the children who were there were like him and had mental health issues. And that, that's what he explained in his um, interview to the BBC. So clearly inspired, clearly helped. Went back to his mainstream school for, for sixth form, I believe. So I don't believe the, the, the Prue had a sixth form um, provision, but has kept that level of aspiration, has really been amazing and, and what an achievement for, for any youngster to get into somewhere 
like Cambridge. Absolutely brilliant. Really, really amazing achievement. And these alternative provision settings, in my experience, whilst I'm not an expert from those, uh, from what I have seen, they are amazing classes and do an amazing job for young people for whom mainstream settings just aren't working. So without any more hesitation and without me waffling on any more at all, I'm going to start to um, bring some of this Academy of Central Bedfordshire group, I'm going to bring you, bring you off mute guys and start to ask you to talk a little bit about your experiences and to welcome you. So Paul, thank you. You're the head teacher, the man in charge. We've got Lynette. Thank you for joining us, Lynette and Rita, the deputy heads, Josh and Claire, the assistant heads. So I wonder maybe, um, and I'm happy, Paul, for you to, to delegate any of the answers to anybody at any point and you to just jump in and, and talk as you want to talk. But would you be able to give us a little bit of, of history about the ACB and just tell us a little bit about how it started and, and that story. Yeah, good evening, Maxine. Hope you're well. Good evening to everybody else. Hello, um, Paul. I am well and good evening to you. Thank you so much to you and your team for being here this evening. It's fantastic to hear you. Yeah, no, we're very excited to come and share our story because I think it's a very interesting one. Um, the ACB was set up in 2013. Uh, under the Free Schools Initiative, and it was actually set up um, by the head teachers of Central Bedfordshire. Um, Peter Cohen and Nigel Croft were the, the forerunners uh, and did the work in putting the bid together. Um, but the idea of the Academy of Central Bedfordshire was to replace the old PRU that was in the local authority at the time uh, and offer a very alternative curriculum. Uh, and I'll probably leave curriculum for, for Rita in a moment uh, to discuss. But effectively, the idea was that we would have specialists within highly specialised and equipped vocational areas that would be able to provide students with that practical learning, but also provide them with a diet of core subjects as well. And the whole aim of the ACB was to improve the outcomes of young people within central Bedfordshire who aren't able to access mainstream education. Um, we are quite unique in our setting in that we offer a pre service to local authority uh, and we also offer school referrals um, as well. So schools are able to commission places with us in, in different formats from part time to full time. Uh, and the way that that is so achievable is by offering a bespoke curriculum uh, and bespoke timetabling so that we're meeting the individual needs of each student that attends the ACB. Um, in a journey of, of the last 10 years, uh, and I'm proud that, that I've been part of that, um, we've seen the needs of the young people who we work with change drastically. Uh, and um, unfortunately, we are feeling the same pressures as everybody else within the country in respect of um, the needs that we are seeing and Lots of those needs requiring specialist placement and unfortunately, perhaps specialist provision not being available. Um, but I'll probably save that for another episode. I think that's probably a whole whole chat on its own. Oh, hello, Paul. Um, and indeed, I think it probably is that whole sort of nature of, of the, the world and the nature of change of need it is itself huge. So you've what you've described there, what I'm hearing from you is um, a... A set up by by head teachers who were were feeling that they needed to be a change to the the existing pupil referral situation or the pupil referral unit and having a more unique curriculum and and yes I can't wait to hear from Rita in a minute or two about exactly what that curriculum sounds like. Um, so so quite fascinating that you were, were set up by head teachers and then governed by by head teachers and um, Pete Cohen, who was the founder head of ACB. That's quite an unusual setup for, for any school leader to have all of their governors being head teachers, isn't it, Paul? It is indeed. And um, we still have many of the head teachers. Some of them have, have, have changed from the original head teachers, mm -hmm. but we are still predominantly governed by the head teachers. 
Um, we also have members of the local authority. Uh, so we have the head of children's services uh, as a as a governor. Uh, we also have uh, we did have the deputy um, chief of police for Bedfordshire uh, as a governor as well. Um, and so yeah, we have a very broad and expert panel of governors yeah. who challenge us uh, and support us so that we are able to provide the best education that we can to some of the most vulnerable young people within central Bedfordshire. Um, and that's that's the key thing, isn't it? Getting it right for the most vulnerable. And that that's where the, the huge challenge lies, because if it was straightforward, it it wouldn't necessarily be an alternative provision that's needed. Your your challenge in meeting those needs and that huge range of needs. And you've described how you offer that dual service that the pupil referral units, the and you provide a provision for students who are permanently excluded. But you also provide a placement for schools where um, head teachers are identifying that they, they've wanted to buy a package from you. But you're providing that that breadth of service, and that itself presents a huge challenge. Surely, it does. And I think um, what is important by having such an expert panel of governors is that that provides confidence in the service that we provide. Um, okay. Because as an alternative provision, um, you know, where perhaps a pupil has been permanently excluded and they have no choice but to attend, that for families is disheartening. Uh, and, yes. we, and we do meet with families very much when they first come who are like, I don't want my child to come. Uh, and I have a phrase actually for them. I say, please give me two weeks and I'll call you at the end of that <laughs> two weeks and discuss with you if you feel that the school is right for your child. And in 10 years, I'm pleased to say that only once out of that many conversations I've had, that only once as a parent said, actually, no, it's not for me. Within two weeks, generally, most parents and, and young people understand what wow. the ACB is about. Uh, and we're pleased to report that most children, I would say as high as 97% of children will say, that they're better off for having come to the ACB. And I know lots of schools have lots of different measures for measuring success. Yeah. Um, but for me, that's the key one at the ACB. That's, uh, that's amazing. And that just really speaks volumes about the success of your amazing school. That, that young people who may be feeling in a place where they are already feeling rejected by the education system in general or are, are feeling disenfranchised and have experienced problems with the education system can come to, to your setting, to a new setting, and then feel like they fit in and feel like they're valued and feel that that's the right choice that's the right place for them so i do think that that really is a great example of of how it, it just proves that the magic of what you're doing and how hard you're working paul absolutely uh and you know as, as you'll hear from other colleagues you know we've got a great team of very knowledgeable colleagues that are experts within their area but also experts within supporting young people with high needs and got a very good Senko so we're able to identify those needs and, and move forward and I think as this episode goes on I'd, I'd love to just take an opportunity to speak about the improvement plan uh, yeah. and the need for standardization within AP because AP is a very broad continuum yes um, and we are a registered school and have a a, a one way of working and there are very other many other ways um but i'm a big fan of there being a standardized framework for ap um but maybe i'll come back to that later on so paul i started this by saying i'm not the expert on on ap and that uh, i've deliberately got an expert group in to talk about it so I'd love to come back in a little while and and hear from you about your views on um the the improvement plan so that's fast that is brilliant and I'm glad therefore that I, I raised it thank you 
can we it seems it feels logical to go from here paul you've you've spoken there about this unique curriculum and about what makes that that really special um so would it be okay to go to rita but happy for anybody else who wants to to jump in as well and support rita to talk a little bit about about curriculum and what makes that so unique and why that that works but i'm happy for anybody else jump take yourself off um take yourself off mute at any point guys and just um put your your views in there but we come to rita talk to us a little bit about what's special about the curriculum for young people at the acb hi maxine Hi, Rita. Thank you so much for joining us. And I know how passionate you are about your fabulous school. I am very passionate about it. Um, what is special about our curriculum? Uh, I think to sum it up is that um, we are all working towards uh, all the students being able to achieve. And uh, the curriculum has change and it keeps on evolving around the need of the children so as paul said when the acb opened 10 years ago um there was um obviously a big focus around vocational areas and offering the opportunities of um accessing those kind of subjects for the students okay. but since then we've evolved into having four different pathways in our curriculum and that four different pathway will become five and potentially even more as the needs of our children become more complex Goodness. and more varied. So we have the four pathway of simply summed up to an academic one because we have more and more a good proportion of children that don't join the ACB with a passion for vocational areas, but they're quite highly academic. And we have recognized that for those children, there is a need to have a curriculum that is more based around their core subjects and um, an extended number of GCSE than normally in alternative provision you don't always find. We okay. still have the big proportion of vocational subjects and we've also extended um, the curriculum with good uh, proportion of sports qualifications and um, that we call the sports leadership pathway. And then as a final one, we have an EHCP interventions pathway, because as Paul mentioned, we have a significant number of students yeah. now that join the academy with an EHCP and they need a variety of interventions to be able to be fully supported. Right. And that's where we stand now. And the interventions, I have to say, is uh, probably um, the biggest strength of our curriculum, whereby um, 15 to 20 percent of our curriculum is designed around individual interventions for the children to be able to fully meet their needs. And that nature of your highly individualised curriculum is very, very special. And how how on earth you m must have to work and juggle to create something that's mm -hmm. that's is that individualized honestly hats off to you I, I think that's amazing um i remember yes when the the acb did first start out it was very much about those vocational areas and you have fantastic motor vehicle um facilities you have of hairdressing i've seen you you have catering but yeah. now i've just heard you say that there is also that large pathway around SEND and there's also the emphasis on the the academic pathway for, for youngsters as well so there really is a um a, a key part of, of that curriculum that makes it right for any child is that right that's that's what I think yeah, I'm hearing from definitely you. definitely this is what it is because obviously we had uh, the children that joined the the academy the ACB um join us with a proportion of needs that have been misrecognized in some way and yeah. amongst these needs there's not i mean there's a lot of talk around alternative provision and the social justice and the need for caring for these children but we have focus around caring for their education as well as the well-being and everything else that i will leave to my other colleagues to talk about and the need for recognizing that some of them have passions that you need to nurture so that they can thrive and progress in their post-16. And that's 
That's absolutely fascinating to hear that. And that ties in with the the story, one of the things that inspired me to talk about the, the young man from Milton Keynes who's got into Cambridge. From from your students, Rita, you've seen your unique curriculum inspire a number of I- individuals to go on to great successes, I suspect. Most definitely, yes. Yeah, that, that, that must be so rewarding um, when that students who weren't achieving, who who possibly weren't even attending school um that that your provision and and that work that you've put in place for them has made that difference that that's pretty amazing isn't it and that is that is the reward that you get back that pays for all the struggles that we have to face when we're trying to meet the needs of the children yeah and that's that's that, I mean, I did. I build tonight to hear um, one of the things to be to be about what are the the absolute joys of working in AP, and then what what are the challenges? And I know we'll come up a, against a lot of those. But anything that that comes to you um, about about that, what's really special about AP and really special about the ACB? Um, what is special about the ACB? I want to say, I mean, the people. And when I say people, is the staff and the students alike. Uh, we have recognised and celebrated all of our differences and diversities and and all of our passions. And, and that's, I think, the biggest strength of the ACB. Well, we're not afraid to be ourselves. You're not afraid to be yourselves. You're individuals, you're diverse, you're proud of the brilliance of those those people. Yeah. That's amazing. Rita, you yourself are, are quite a um, fascinating um, <laughs> character, I think. So go on, tell us a little bit about you and your role and, and about you as a person, things that, that you are really passionate about and you do at the ACB. Definitely. I joined the ACB in 2015. And when I joined the ACB, um, something clicked and I knew that I found my place. But fascinating enough, when I joined the ACB, I was unqualified teacher because wow. as you can gather from my accent I'm not <laughs> originally <laughs> from this country and uh, I had to requalify when when I moved to the UK okay and and I had the experience of doing that through the ACB uh, that supported me uh, to to requalify but I also had a huge passion for learning and a huge passion for learning that um, I took from um being a child for which school was a safe place and 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 so i started pushing for more subjects i remember when i joined the acb we didn't used to have science as a subject i gather a small group of um, year 10 students and we run the first round of gcse science exams and from there my passion for the curriculum the timetabling and so on has taken me to where i am today so you've been a real key driver then in bringing some of those academic subjects like science into the heart of the ACB and putting them on those pathways, which is, you know, that's an amazing achievement, Rita. Oh, definitely. Paul knows I nagged enough about it <laughs> until, <laughs> until I got some of the things uh, changed. But yeah, no, I, I think can... we, we're proud to say that, that we have a strong curriculum because of that. That's that's amazing. And and Rita, you are a doctoral student as well. Tell us a I little am. bit about that. I am just started. Um, in 2019, I mean, I was always researching because obviously passion for learning never stops. And I was always researching about different ways for children to learn. Um, and then someone that is in this group, which is Lynette, that mm. is about to finish her doctorate. Yes. Uh, she convinced me to get through the journey of a master's in UK. I already had um, a master's in Italy. And I started in 2019 with research and I'm not stopping. So I just uh, <laughs> I just started my doctoral journey in, in September. And it's really exciting to see, oh to, to be a researcher and to be a practitioner at the same time. So to see... Um, what research can bring to the school in terms of equipping with more and more tools that we can utilise to support these children. Wow. Um, I mean, Paul, a, a doctoral student and somebody just completing their doctorate on your senior leadership team, that's quite something, isn't it? It is indeed. And it's allowed us to stay 
at the very forefront of research and, and yeah. make sure that our practice is, is as sort of cutting edge as it can be. Uh, and, and both Lynette and Rita have very much shaped our practice and, and hopefully Lynette might talk to you um, about how she's influenced our trauma-informed practice development uh, and, and what that looks like. Um, because as I said earlier, the needs of the young people have, have very much changed over time. And I think if we had carried on doing what we did in 2013, uh, we certainly wouldn't be having the successes we are today. And I think that's all, you know, that is the challenge of AP, is it constantly has to evolve to, to meet the needs of the, of the young people that it has the pleasure of working with. Well, and you use the phrase pleasure and that absolutely comes through in volumes with, with all of your team, Paul, with, with everybody feels very privileged. I can see that to work with the young people that they work with. And in terms of being at the forefront of research, your your team is really, really showing that. So I think next we'll we'll go on and we'll have a look about what's special about the, the ACB in more general terms. And and I'll I'll um take it to you to have a think where you want to go next. But I'm gonna give you all a little bit of a pause, first of all, whilst we play a little bit of a note from the sponsors. Just Finance Foundation proudly sponsors Teachers Talk Radio for Talk Money Week. Join us from Saturday the 4th of November for a week of incredible guests and thought-provoking discussions on how teachers can talk about money in the classroom. Tune in, be inspired and empower the future generation. Teachers Talk Radio, sponsored by Just Finance Foundation, helping children manage money wisely. Visit our website for the schedule and details, justfinancefoundation.org.uk. Are you looking for for lesson planning materials to kickstart the new term, we've got you covered. The Day is a global online resource that turns the news into lessons. We're offering listeners a free resource on Andrew Tate that you can find on thedaynews.co forward slash Tate. Inspire personal development and critical thinking for your students by downloading the Tate Debate today and feel more confident addressing sensitive topics with your class. Visit thedaynews.co forward slash Tate to find out more. This show is brought to you in partnership with John Cat Educational, publishing professional development books and resources to support great teaching and learning in schools around the world. Have you checked out their latest releases? Use the code JCTTR2324 for 20% off your order. Don't miss out. Visit johncatbookshop.com to explore their full range of titles and advance your own professional development today. Happy reading. In today's... So fascinating to hear there from our sponsors. A couple of things just to pick up on there. Some really, really good um, resources um, advertised from the middle of those three sponsors. Just Finance, a whole series of finance programmes coming up on Teachers Talk Radio, starting tomorrow, Saturday the 4th at 11 o'clock with, with Tom HB, um, with a couple of, couple of really exciting guests asking why is financial education important? And one just to flag that I think might be really interesting given tonight's guests, Thursday the 9th at 7.30, um, adapting financial literacy for an AP, um, for AP uh, students at alternative provision and with a focus on AP learners and learners with SEMH. So that sounds like a really fascinating one. And I have to give a great shout out to the, the John Cat um, books. One of those really influenced my show, um, actually going back four weeks now. So I was poorly a fortnight ago, missed my show, but four weeks ago when I talked about social equity and uh, class issues in the classroom, that book there um, the, uh, was really good, an excellent John Cat book. So really good, really good mention there, I hope, to our sponsors, providing some fantastic materials for us as educators. So back to the Academy of Central Bedfordshire and I wonder who would like to come in and just talk a little bit about what's really special about the ACB. So anybody at all, jump in, whoever, whoever would like to. Uh, I'm going to go first if that's okay. And then Great, I'll yeah, and, yeah. Uh, add if they, if they, if they wish. Um, the obvious is obviously school structure and, and the systems that we have. Yeah. But everybody will have those. 
the, the people, it's the staff, as Rita said. Um, mm. One of the things that's really important to us at the ACB is that we all have a shared set of values and that we all understand what we're coming to. Um, in interview, we do ask people about the values that are important to them. Um, but Paul, that's to... fascinating because we often talk values and they can become um, a, a lot of words that appear on a wall. But at the ACB, there's something that you really live by, aren't they? And you, you structure everything around them. So I think that's fascinating. They are indeed. Yeah, we have achieving, caring and belonging. Uh, nicely fit ACB. Uh, and like you said, we like to see those in everything that we do. But from a staff's point of view, people buy into the fact that they're coming to work with some of the most vulnerable young people in the yeah. county to provide them with a second chance of being successful in education when the first attempt, for whatever reason, hasn't worked out for them. And that requires a high degree of resilience. But if you're truly aligned to our values and you buy into the fact that you are coming to make a difference. In fact, you know, you're coming to help effectively save lives because if we do our job well, mm. our young people leave very successful, very well qualified and very well equipped to go on and have really productive and successful lives. And that's why having the right people is so important. Uh, I know that perhaps, you know, some people look at AP and think, yeah, you know, that will be easy. You know, teaching in a classroom <laughs> of five to six will be a piece of cake um, and having come from mainstream myself um, before I came to the ACB you know, I, I also perhaps made that assumption I thought the numbers will be easy uh, mm. but actually the needs are so high and complex yeah. that the small numbers are very quickly forgotten because the level of planning and individual knowledge is so high um, but when I talk about the people in the environment, the staff, you know, I'm not just talking about the teachers, I'm talking about the TAs, the, the cleaning staff, the admin staff, every single member of the ACB is in, spoken to, but buys into that whole philosophy of coming to work with some of the most vulnerable young people to make their lives better. And on top of that, I can't be on here without mentioning the dogs. Uh, many school dogs uh, who do a great job in providing us with that calm, reflective, therapeutic degree uh, of work that we do. Uh, and I, I won't take too much thunder away from the dogs because obviously you know, Claire is a champion on that factor as well. But yes, <laughs> the team is made up of not only of, of, of people, but also dogs um, because they do have such a, a massive impact. And I think if we had a student on here, and you spoke to them about, you know, what are some of the key parts that support them through perhaps some of the difficult times, they would say they definitely would mention one of the six dogs. Oh, my goodness. How fantastic. I, I, I always think a school dog is a great asset. Six school dogs. Wow, that's that's something quite special, Paul. But you talked about saving lives and then and went on to explain that and talk about the real life changing work that you and this amazing team of teaching assistants, cleaners, teachers, leaders, everybody who's involved all gets gets buys into through those those values. That's that's pretty something. It is. It's a, it's, it's a real strong um, responsibility uh, that we have, you know, every mm. day that we come in, every day is a new day, regardless of what happened the day before, we approach in a positive, friendly, welcoming manner, uh, so that students feel safe and happy and secure. And part of what we do is, is to teach that sometimes the experience that we had the day before, that's a learning episode, we learn from that, uh, and perhaps that won't be repeated in the future um, yeah that's so, that's that's fantastic we learn we move on we use that that's very much central to your way of working your values absolutely and you keep them really simple paul thank you and you speak so passionately about your school and absolutely rightly want to go first um are you are you happy to hand over to one of your team then who'd like to, to go in next tell us a little about what's special about the ap to you and from your perspective Lynette, great to hear from you. Um, and hello and hello to everyone else. Um, apologies in advance if I disappear because I start coughing. Uh, just pre-warn you. Um, I think for me, it's the pure 
pure joy of seeing these young people develop. Um, we are a school, we are very much focused on their learning, um, but it is the whole child that we work with. Uh, there are many barriers when they walk through our doors um, to engaging in their learning, anxiety around being in the classroom, um, diagnosed or undiagnosed learning needs, their own experiences outside of school and what they're dealing with before they even walk in at nine o'clock in the morning, um, what they've had to go through that morning already. Um, there's lots and lots of things that we need to consider. Um, I know there'll be people on here that recognise behaviour as communication um, and what we focus on is understanding why that behaviour is happening and what they are trying to communicate. Um, and working with that child over time and seeing that child being able to manage themselves, seeing that child being able to recognise achievements both in the classroom with their learning, in the way that they manage themselves in situations when they have arguments with other people or have falling outs with other people, being able to recognise they can actually manage the stresses that are happening in their lives um, and walk out of our doors at the end of year 11 or even to a new school before that knowing that they will be able to manage um, is what is really special. So, Lynette, that's, that's absolutely fantastic. What I think I'm hearing from you there was very much about you're seeing um, behaviour as communication and you're, you're acknowledging it as, as that. However, what you're not doing is then saying, and that's okay to just keep repeating that and remain in those same patterns. What, you're, what you've spoken about then is young people learning and all, and that's again linked to what Paul was saying a, a few moments ago about all these learning opportunities, learning to regulate, learning to respond differently so that they can be successful either, and you've referenced the end of year 11 or back in mainstream school. I think that's what I'm, I'm hearing from you there. That's part of the, the central part of your work yeah absolutely i think um i started working in alternative position um don't calculate my age but over 50 <laughs> and i'd come out of my and i'd gone into alternative position and i'm thinking but these children need to be in the classroom learning and absolutely yes they do but one of the um members of staff turned around to me and said but it doesn't matter how many GCSEs, GCSEs she leaves school with. If she walks into a nursery and swears, she will be out of her job. Yeah. And so it, we need to look at everything for that child and be preparing them to walk out of our doors to be able to function in any situation. And how crucial is that? And that's absolutely central to everything, isn't it? The, the education, the academic rigour that you've described there in the curriculum has been really important but also those key life lessons about how we manage ourselves in different situations is so crucial yes and i think based on what paul said about changing lives it really does um they need to be able to do everything they need to be able to get their qualifications so they get the best life chances that in itself provides some level of therapeutic healing because they're learning that they can learn um, they're learning that they can achieve, they're learning that they can take risks within the classroom. Um, but also we work with the child around taking risks in social relationships. Some of them are very scared to go on trips, for example, because they know they can't manage their anger very well. Mm -hmm. Actually walking out of school into an unfamiliar environment to go to college, to go to work, to even go on a school trip is very scary for them because they don't believe that they can manage themselves they still are relying on someone else to manage them that's fascinating that that self-management and those key skills being really important and and how do you teach that how do you get young people to um be able to manage themselves or believe that they can manage themselves i cannot emphasize the importance of relationships enough um, in all aspects any guise of learning, whether that's academic, whether that's personal, whether it's emotional, they need to have trust in the person that is doing the teaching. And I mean teaching in the widest sense. So the relationships are absolutely crucial. Building those trusting relationships with those young person, uh, with the young people. And that takes time. That can take a lot of testing of boundaries uh, with that young person. Um, but as Paul said, we start every day afresh. And so they learn to trust us they learn to understand they learn to 
rely on the fact that we're not going to break. Um, they can push us. I mean, we do have limits, but they can push us. Mm. Um, and we won't break. We're not going to reject them. They're not going to say, sorry, you're not good enough. We're going to continue to reinforce that we believe in them. And eventually they internalise that message. That's fascinating, Lynette. And that, so the, the crux of that is you being there, refusing to reject them, but also finding those that balance around the boundaries and what, what you, you can accept. But that, that crucial thing is getting that trust and building that relationship. Absolutely. And the, the, as you said, the boundaries are so important within that as well. They have to be there. Otherwise, the child doesn't feel safe. Mm. And they don't know what is expected of them. And they will push against those boundaries. And, and this is what staff do so well is they keep those boundaries in place and then work with the child within those boundaries. And it does show quite how amazing your team are to, to continue to do that and to be tested in there and to have that, that relentless um, building of relationships and, and be able to be that person that, that won't give up and won't lose trust and won't lose face and won't reject, which is, is pretty amazing. Thank you so much, Lynette. Um, you yourself, you are um, currently completing your, your PhD, I understand, as well. I am. <laughs> wow. <laughs> That's fantastic. And your, your routine and the, the contribution that you make there with that is fantastic. I mean, fancy having all of that up-to-date research going on on a, on a senior team. Really good. Thank you so much for speaking. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to suggest we call for another short break um, where we're going to hear from our sponsors again. And we're also going to hear a little bit of news. So I hope if um, if everybody does who's here talking this evening does need to take five, that's absolutely fine. Um, and we're going to go into the news. Just Finance Foundation proudly sponsors Teachers Talk Radio for Talk Money Week. Join us from Saturday the 4th of November for a week of incredible guests and thought-provoking discussions on how teachers can talk about money in the classroom. Tune in, be inspired and empower the future generation. Teachers Talk Radio, sponsored by Just Finance Foundation, helping children manage money wisely. Visit our website for the schedule and details, justfinancefoundation.org.uk. Are you looking for lesson planning materials to kickstart the new term? We've got you covered. The Day is a global online resource that turns the news into lessons. We're offering listeners a free resource on Andrew Tate that you can find on thedaynews.co forward slash Tate. Inspire personal development and critical thinking for your students by downloading the Tate Debate today and feel more confident addressing sensitive topics with your class. Visit thedaynews.co forward slash Tate to find out more. This show is brought to you in partnership with John Cat Educational, publishing professional development books and resources to support great teaching and learning in schools around the world. Have you checked out their latest releases? Use the code JCTTR2324 for 20% off your order. Don't miss out. Visit johncatbookshop.com to explore their full range of titles and advance your own professional development today. Happy reading. In today's educational environment, students and teachers are juggling a mix of face-to-face, -face, online and blended learning courses. Canvas by Instructure helps teachers navigate these diverse learning experiences with a user-friendly virtual learning environment that offers flexible access to courses and a consistent learning experience, all while streamlining everyday teaching processes. The world's best schools and universities are using Canvas to create dynamic courses, collaborate seamlessly, and access actionable data that drives student success. This is Teachers Talk Radio, and this is Teachers Talk Radio News. A record number of students from disadvantaged backgrounds have applied for the most selective UK university degrees, says a report on the BBC News website. The report is based on data released by the Universities and Colleges Admissions Service, known as UCAS. The students have applied to Oxford and Cambridge and four degrees in medicine, dentistry and veterinary science. UCAS Interim Chief Executive San Crystal 
described the applications, which have an October deadline, as encouraging. The Sutton Trust charity, however, said that the advantage gap had hardly shifted. The data is based on a participation of local areas measure, which splits students into five groups based on how many people aged 18 and 19 in their area go on to higher education. Those from areas where the fewest numbers of young people go to university are classed as the most disadvantaged. Applications for this group are up by 7% since last year, in contrast to the most advantaged areas, which is up by only 2%. However, the total number of applicants from the most advantaged areas is over 17,000, compared to a little over 3,000 from the most disadvantaged areas. Other key findings from October applications include a 6% increase in the number of UK applicants receiving free school meals, although the overall numbers of those receiving free meals is on the rise. A drop of 7% a year in 18-year-olds applying to medicine degrees and a slight drop in total numbers of international applicants. Education Secretary Gillian Keegan was in the news again this week as she told English schools that parents have a right to view the sex education materials which are being taught in schools. The announcement comes as the government is due to launch a public consultation into relationships, sex and health education. Guidance has been in place since the subject became compulsory in primary and secondary schools in September 2020. But Miss Keegan said she wanted to debunk the myth that parents cannot see what their children are being taught. Jeff Barton of Askell said he agreed with transparency on RSHE materials and that this is key, but that sending the letter when some schools were on half term was slightly odd. The BBC also reports that Meta, the parent company of Facebook and Instagram, has been accused of misleading the public about the risks of social media and of contributing to a mental health crisis amongst youth. The claims were made in a federal lawsuit in the United States, but many in other countries will be following with interest. The lawsuit accuses the company of ensnaring users whilst concealing the substantial dangers of its platforms. It also said that the company had collected data on children under the age of 13 and that this breached the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act. Meta is contesting the lawsuit and will likely present research it says shows that teens say social media actually helps them when they are struggling. It's not the first time social media companies have faced lawsuits, but it is the first time so many attorneys general, 33 in total, have signed such a suit. In addition to those already filed by families, young people and school districts. Those working with children and young people in the UK will undoubtedly be interested in the progress of the lawsuit. Dyslexia Scotland has announced on its website that former Strictly Come Dancing winner and Dyslexia Scotland ambassador Hamza Yassin will talk to an audience as part of Dyslexia Awareness Week Scotland. Yassin, who is dyslexic, became an ambassador for the charity earlier this year. He says he is passionate about sharing his story during events held in the first week in November. In a week where The Guardian reports that more than one million UK children experienced destitution last year, meaning their families could not adequately feed, clothe, clean or keep them warm, the BBC covered a story of a primary school in Peckham where most children are homeless. The school has nearly 300 pupils, all of whom received free uniform, trips and meals. The school conducted a survey in which most families described themselves as living in non-secure tenancies. This can mean sofa surfing with friends, living in B&B accommodation or living in hostels. Parents of children at the school spoke positively about the support they received from the school, but also focused on the toll the uncertainty took on them and their children. Meanwhile, The Guardian tells of concerns expressed by poverty campaigners, teachers and welfare workers about the damaging effects of destitution, including physical ill health, mental illness, school absence and poor behaviour. Both articles can be found online and give more details on the latest findings. Finally, Schools Week reports that as many as one in ten school workers had to wait over 60 days for DBS checks last year. A Freedom of Information request showed that 2.5% of those submitted took more than 60 days to complete, more than triple the rate in 2021-22. to 22. 
Jeff Barton of Askell says it all adds to the pressure that school leaders and teachers face in recruitment and reflects the widespread underinvestment in public services. A spokesperson for the DBS said neither Ofsted nor the DAB have raised any concerns about delays. This has been your Teachers Talk Radio News with Joe Fox. And welcome back. Thank you, Joe. Um, again, another brilliant news bulletin there. Great to hear from Joe. And some things there that I think could possibly resonate with our AP um, colleagues on here this evening. Um, I think I heard from that that um, applications from students from disadvantaged backgrounds were up for some university places, which sounds super positive. Um, but again, lots and lots of challenges in the world there. So we're going to go over to, to Claire now. Thank you, Claire, for volunteering to go next. And of course, I thought it was only while I was listening and reflecting um, through the news there that we've met Josh before on Teachers Talk Radio as well. So I look forward to hearing from Josh in just a minute. So, but Claire, first. First of all, from your perspective, what's special about the ACB and, and if you want to talk at anything about AP in general and, and also your role and what you're, you're doing. So over to you, Claire. Hello, Maxine. Thank you for having me back again. You're welcome. Lovely to have you back. Um, what is special about the ACB? Well, it's for me, it, people have said it already, it is about the people, it's the staff and the students. But it, it's also because we can be so individualised in what we do, we can really tailor things and you really see the young people growing and you see them making progress in ways that perhaps in another setting wouldn't get recognised or they wouldn't have the opportunity to do, um, which is really, really lovely. Um, for me, it's... I, I was previously, you know, I was in a role where I was working with children who had SEND, um, my two Senko roles. Um, but I got to a point where I found that I was just feeling like you were too constrained. There were too many limitations on what you were trying to do. And although people were within the school trying to be very flexible and make accommodations, there was only so far you could go. And to me, I just felt like there was so much more that could be done. Um, so on a personal level, I feel like I've found a place that I really fit in because the values that I have and the values of the school and the rest of the staff are all aligned. And I just love going to work every day because oh. you walk in <laughs> and it's, it's just, you know, you're going to be met with smart faces with people who are ready to go. And as Paul said, and as Lynette and Rita have said, every day is a new day. You go again. And you just get that chance each time to, to try something new and try something different. So, absolutely. Well, it, it doesn't get better than that, Claire. You've described being excited about going into work and loving going into work every day. I can, I can hear that in, in your colleagues as well on your team. And you've spoken about this amazing team. So, again, you've just talked, and this has been a theme that's run through this very much, individualised plans and individualised focus and curriculum and support and relationships for young people, seeing them grow and then having the opportunities that they wouldn't necessarily get in mainstream, which is what brings about the success. Is that, that's what I think what I'm hearing from you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And again, that whole idea about value is amazing. Now, your role, which I think might be a, a topic for another um, another um teachers talk radio special claire so i won't i won't go on this one for too long but really interesting how the senior roles are structured um and again we've we've already heard from lynette who leads on behavior and attitudes and rita who leads on quality of ed and curriculum and we'll be hearing from josh in a moment who leads on on personal development your role is all around well-being so it would be remiss of us not to give that a mention and how that works in an AP setting. What, what's that all about? What's the, the crux of that? Um, well, I'm very keen that it's, you know, well-being is not just about the staff. It's about everybody um, that has involvement in the school. So obviously the students, they are there every day, as are the staff, um, but also people who they're coming into contact with outside of school which you know obviously directly there's their their families 
Um, so I've got a couple of projects on the go this year to start looking at parental engagement. And that's, that's not just around parents responding to phone calls, emails coming into parent emails and things like that. But it's about how we can engage parents to support their well-being, which will in turn support their child's well-being. Because we know that for a lot of our children, they are coming from backgrounds where there are significant disadvantages, mental yeah. ill health um, and things like that. So it's really exciting to sort of be able to take well-being out of just the school context and actually start to spread it a little bit, bit wider. Um, so making it a key part of the whole school community, not just pigeonholing it into to one particular area. And that idea of how that ties into parental engagement, parent parents engaging with and buying into a whole school ethos that is very much around well-being. I think that's what I'm, I'm hearing from you, Claire. It sounds fascinating. Yeah, and it's, it's very much in its infancy at the moment. But yeah, you're right. And it is about how we can get the parents to buy in. And as Paul said earlier on, it is really common for parents when their children first start with us that they say, mm. oh, I don't know if this is right for my child. And actually, yeah. I want it to be right not just for the child, but for the parents and the families too. And that is a really interesting way of, of really getting to the heart of what is special about your school, that whole community. Thank you so much, Claire. And anybody else do, do feel that you, you can just jump in at, at any particular point. But I, I want to just go to Josh and, and hear from, you, from Josh, if you're, you're okay with that. What is it that's special about the ACB to you? And tell us a little bit about your role and, and where and how you fit in. Hi, Maxine. Thank you for having me again. Oh, you're really welcome, Josh. Thank you so much for um, coming in. And it's, it's always nice to hear from you. No, um, I think... With the ACB, what makes it so special is that we give, as you know, as I can, as has already been said around giving students a second chance. But you know, we give students, you know, a lot of opportunities that you know they wouldn't get elsewhere, whether that be in the classroom and also outside the classrooms. You know, we we run a lot of trips every year. We run real world experiences. We run um, trips that are that are points based, but also trips around cultural capital and stuff like that. So. You know, for for us, it's about giving those students the opportunity that maybe they don't get elsewhere, maybe they don't get, um, you know, at home as well. Yeah. You know, our weeks are all are all focused around getting to a Friday for Celebration Assembly, where our students can can win prizes for all their hard work in the week. And you know, the opportunities that we give them through vouchers and through um, you know, we go on family days out and stuff like that, it's so different to what you'd get. In, in any other setting, in any other school, you know, I don't really know of, of any other school or setting that offers, you know, the reward um, for education that we do. Um, and, you know, that's what makes us so unique, I think. And Josh, that's something that's very, very special. You've described there about students getting from the ACB opportunities that they wouldn't necessarily get without the ACB, either um, from from home or from from other schools. And you, you've said there about a number of trips and visits, but also things within school. Yeah, you know, we run a reward trip every every half term, um, which students work towards um, throughout the half term by earning points in lessons. Um, but then we mm. also run department trips um, that give students, you know, just the opportunity to go out uh, and, and build on their social skills um, and, and put them in situations that, you know, as we spoke about earlier, situations that maybe do make them feel a little bit uncomfortable and outside their comfort zone. But that's, you know, that's part of the hard work that we have to do because, we have to prepare them for a life after the ACB. Um, and yeah. a lot of the work we do around that, um, you know, starts with, with, with getting them out into the public domain and taking them off site away from school, um, whether that be through work experience or through trips um, or just through visits to, you know, it could be a museum or wherever. And that's, that's a theme that I've heard quite a lot through this evening has been that huge emphasis and, and I guess that all schools have this this emphasis and this this is part of one of the things that all schools should be doing but I feel it really strongly from you um, at, at the ACB and, and 
you know, this, this AP focus about preparing students for life beyond the ACB. So we've talked about academic preparation, making sure that there are either exams or vocational learning, but also that uh, moving on as, as people and, and having those experiences so that you can then cope and manage and th more than cope can actually thrive beyond. I think that's what I'm hearing from you. Yeah, definitely. And I think for me, probably the most rewarding, rewarding part of the job is that, you know, when a student joins the ACB, you know, they might have low self-esteem, no confidence, mm. uh, maybe their social skills maybe aren't where their peers would be. Um, but, you know, nine times out of ten, by the time they've left the ACB, you know, students are ready to go into the community. They are ready to thrive. They are ready to transition to that next stage, whether that be back to a mainstream setting or to another school yes. that, that better suits their needs. Um, or whether that be post-16 when they're going off to college or, or to get a job or an apprenticeship. Um, you know, we have some real tough, tough days um, working in AP. But actually, when yeah. you reflect and when you look back... Um, on all the successes that we've had with all of the students that we that we've had the pleasure to teach um seeing the progress that they make not just academically but as a as a person as a whole um you know that for me is is the crux of why you know I love working at the ACB so much and that's a really interesting thing again from you Josh you've just spoken with warmth and genuine passion that's why I love working at the ACB. We, we have heard that from from all of your colleagues, actually, that excitement about working there. Yeah, because, you know, I think it's just it's such a unique place. It's so different from from any other service or school that's out there. And, um, mm. you know, we've all spoken, everyone's spoken about, um, you know, the staff and the students make the school and the staff work so hard and the students work so hard to, you know, the students work so hard to improve themselves as, as people, but also academically, and then the staff work so hard with the students to to help them achieve. Um, going back to our values, you know, to help them achieve and to help them to belong. You know, they probably never really felt that they belonged to school before. And, no. You know, like we said, you know, Paul says, you know, give me two weeks, give us two weeks. <laughs> and within those two weeks, you know, nine times out of ten, the student does feel that they that they belong in that school, and, and that's a big part of it. Yes, and that whole idea about belonging is something that's come through really, really strongly. Thank you so much, Josh. I'm just going to um, call on a couple of things that are um, some things that, that you guys flagged and said about the ACB. Um, and I think you've, you've had a chance to say these this evening, but, but please jump in if, if you haven't, you've got anything to add. So it's a place where everyone is valued for who they are, staff and students. For students where mains um, where mainstream hasn't worked gives them a fresh start they have the opportunity to try vocational subjects and for many show their intelligence in ways that are not always available in mainstream but still have that academic opportunity as well small classes help students to regulate as there's less sensory input and trauma-informed practice is used throughout the school to help with with emotional regulation now Lynette you mentioned um, a little bit about that briefly i don't know whether there's anything that any of you want to to add about that statement but it's you know it's really evident that that that's strength in what you do you also um you know say you've got we've talked a lot about adapting to students needs on an individual basis that's something that that's really come through and you've talked a lot as well about um those whole those relate these relationships and making sure you provide security for students who often have significant sends or, or aces and then they get that security that they wouldn't get elsewhere so any sort of final closing words on this and about the brilliance of the ACB from any of you come on come and join in whoever would like to Sometimes we have to take the students right back to the beginning. Yeah. And play is so, so important for that. Yeah. We have got a nurture group running um, for some students that can't cope with six different lessons a day with six different teachers. Um, and also the importance of the pastoral support being available at all times. Um, so if they can't cope with the lessons, they can come out and they can access that support 
Um, and again, with a view to not reducing that support, but supporting the student and managing themselves over time. So <coughs> with students that struggle at the beginning, it may be that they need two or three hours a day, um, one to one with a member of staff to support them. Yeah. And we will reduce that down. We will actively put strategies in place to reduce that time, uh, to reduce that over time. Um, and I think the other aspect, um, which I know have been touched on already, is the importance of the multi-agency work we do and the importance of the work that we do with the parents. And yeah. Because it's not, we're not just working in a silo with the young person. We are working with everyone else. We're bringing in therapeutic support. We're bringing in community support from police, um, social care, parents themselves. And it is, again, it's, it's not just about the whole child, but it's about the whole community coming in to support that child as well. Thank you, Lina. And what is absolutely fascinating is, is hearing you as a team almost ending each other's sentences and, and crossing over and, and similar themes that are coming through so strongly. That whole message about um, whole families and communities. Thank you. Rita, I know you want to add something. So come on, please, please join in. Let's hear from you. Uh, just briefly, I mean, you mentioned the story of the student uh, from the Bridge Academy that is yes. joining in university. Uh, we have recently... Um, a former student has recently joined our staff team. Um, <gasps> wow! She left the academy five years ago. One yeah. of the highest achievers um, of the academy. Uh, she recently joined our staff team and she has been an amazing, incredible addition to our staff team. And um, what a great story. What a great example of, of success. I always think if somebody will go back and teach at their old school or work at their old school in some way, that's saying that there's something going very, very right there. That's great to hear. Thank you, Rita. So as we come towards the end, I'm going to come to, to the boss. I'm going to come to the executive head. Not, Paul, that you behave like the boss in any way, shape or form and, uh, you know, are always really, really democratic with your team. But just last couple of words for you on the ACB and also um, any wider political statements or anything that you want to say about um, the, the changes and about the, the action plan. So, Paul, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, I think what I'm really proud of at the ACB is that many young people have the exit route that suits them. So Yeah. I had the pleasure recently of a young man who I actually worked with nine years ago, popped in to see me uh, or popped in to see staff, actually not just myself, but popped in to see colleagues. He was in the area uh, and he now has his own tree surgery business. He's a tree surgeon. Brilliant. Surgery, very successful. Um, but we also, just the article in the news about disadvantaged young people getting access to, to university. We're fortunate that our chair of governors uh, Steve Gray, who has many connections, but one of them is with the Wadham Project, uh, and that's all about providing yeah. young people with access to higher education. Uh, and we have one young person currently in the second year of that project, uh, and so we're very keen and very positively thinking about her ending up at university in a couple of years' time. So it's those moments that, that are truly motivating and allow us to continue to enjoy our work because you see young people moving on, like I said, to be successful, but in whatever yeah. success is for them. Um, and totally. And to run a tree surgery business is, is an immense level of success, in my opinion, as is being part of a project that's a route to university. You have many reasons to be proud of your school, Paul, and your, your leaders. That's amazing to hear. Yeah, absolutely. And I think AP is currently under, under a great deal of pressure. I think yeah. I speak to other AP providers, um, some not registered rate schools some are registered schools but they're all facing the same problem which is that they are oversubscribed because mainstream schools are referring to ap because they need to support complex children with high needs 
Um, and I think nationally, the SEND system doesn't provide the level of provision yeah. that it needs to. And so that backfill of overflow of unmet needs is leading to, to schools looking to source different solutions. And they all tend to be not necessarily the long term solution. And I think going forward with the with the new paper, the improvement plan, I absolutely agree with what it's talking about in terms of trying to keep students in mainstream and working and, and when they need to coming out and then at some point looking to go back in. Um, but we have seen in the last 18 months, young people coming out with such complex needs. Right. That means they need so much time and work and, and specialist intervention in order to be able to move on to the next stage. Um, and until that aspect is addressed, I, I'm not confident that the new plan will be fully achievable. I appreciate that's a strong statement, um, but that's that's certainly my view at this point. I, I agree, Paul. It's a very brave statement. You say it's a strong statement, but um, that's really clearly evidenced the level of pressure that um, APs and, and your own setting, which, which your colleagues haven't gone into great detail about this evening, um, but those pressures around SEND and um, the system in general is putting quite a lot of pressure on you, isn't it? It is, and it is a national issue that needs yeah. direction from from central government as to a plan because it's not just our area and we're very lucky we work with a supportive local authority mm. uh, who will try you know to support the students who attend the acb um but it still means that young people are are not necessarily getting the access to the provision that they might need um and that's what i hear from when i speak to colleagues in in other local authorities that we neighbor um, so, Paul, I think what I'm hearing in summary, and if we can start to draw together this evening, um, some amazing successes at, at your alternative provision, again, at the Academy of Central Bedfordshire, again, will be mirrored in many, many others with people doing a great job. We've seen these themes about individualised plans around great success for young people. You're doing a really good job. But what I'm hearing from you, I think, is a call for some national change to support that and support that continued growth. Absolutely. Uh, and I'm afraid to say I can only see it coming with significant investment. Mm. Uh, and I think, yeah. you know, we see, you know, we see funding changing in many different ways and, and lots of schools saying that they're un, you know, underfunded and rightly so. Um, and, and until schools are given the resources they need, we're still going to see needs being struggling to be met. And thank you so much, Paul, for putting that so beautifully. And thank you to you for the amazing job and your team, the amazing top job that all of you do for some of our most vulnerable youngsters in central Bedfordshire. Um, thank you again. And let's take that as our final parting word from you, Paul. Thank you. You're doing a brilliant job. You're doing everything that you can. But nationally, we need some more investment. We need some changes nationally so that people like you in settings like yours can continue to do the great job you're doing for these young people that really need you. So finally, all that is left for me to do is to say a huge thank you to um, Paul, Lynette, Josh, Claire and Rita for joining us this evening on this evening's Teachers Talk Radio. Thank you to all of you. Let's say goodbye. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you, Maxine. Bye. Thank you to all of them. You've been listening to Teachers Talk Radio. Tune in live and listen back at ttradio.org. We look forward to hearing from you next time on Teachers Talk Radio.